Hello everyone. I hope that you are having a wonderful day today. My name is Miss Stephanie and I'm from the St. Matthews branch. And today I'm going to be sharing some of my favorite stories about mythical creatures. Mythical creatures are everywhere. Almost every country in the world has their own type of mythical creatures. There are dragons and unicorns, yetis, Bigfoot, mermaids, so many. We're gonna get started and dive right in. The first thing we're gonna do is a little finger rhyme with some dragons. So friends, you're gonna have to use your imagination if you're at home. I happen to have two finger puppets that a friend made for me. And their names are Jack and Jill. So if you're at home, can you hold up two fingers like this for me? One on each hand, okay? Two little dragons sitting on a hill, one named Jack and one named Jill. Fly away, Jack. Fly away, Jill. Come back, Jack. Come back, Jill. There they are. Now, there are lots of different ways that you can do this. You can also have them be sitting on a cloud. How about that? Let's try that one. Two little dragons sitting on a cloud. One was quiet and one was loud. Very good, friends. You guessed it. Fly away, quiet. Shh. Fly away, loud. Come back, quiet. Come back, loud. Good job, friends. So there's all sorts of things that you can do with it. It's a really fun and simple finger play. Our first story is Not Your Typical Dragon by Dan Barrell with pictures by Tim Bowers. Are you ready, friends? Crispin Blaze was born into a proud family of fire-breathing dragons. Every blaze breathes fire, explained his father. I breathe fire, your mother breathes fire, and tomorrow, when you turn seven, you'll breathe fire too. The little dragon imagined all the forests he would burn down. He dreamed of all the castles he would destroy. He also considered boiling water to make tea, but he didn't tell his father that. The next day, Crispin sat among family and friends as a big cake was brought to the table. Who will light the birthday candles? His mother asked. I will, declared Crispin. He could feel a tingling inside his tummy, but when he opened his mouth, fire did not come out. What do you think it was, friends? Whipped cream came out. Crispin, shouted his father, dragons breathe fire. What will the neighbors think, worried his mother. I love whipped cream, said his little sister, Ashley. The little dragon was whisked off to the doctor the very next day. Please fix my son, demanded Crispin's father. What seems to be the problem, asked the doctor. Crispin opened his mouth and breathed, but fire did not come out. Band-aids came out. I see, said the doctor gravely. Dragons should breathe fire, insisted Crispin's father. We were low on band-aids, said the nurse. The doctor sent Crispin home with medicine. He swallowed two teaspoons before going to school. It will help you become a real dragon, said his father with a wink. After school, Crispin joined his, fire, his first fire breathing practice. One by one, little dragons aimed their fiery breath at stacks of logs until they burst into flames. Crispin stepped up confidently. He could feel the medicine bubbling in his belly, but when he opened his mouth, fire did not come out. Marshmallows came out. Dragons breathe fire, yelled the coach. Isn't that right, class? but the other dragons didn't answer. They were too busy looking for pointy sticks for marshmallow roasting. I guess I'm not a real dragon, Crispin thought. He worried that his family would be disappointed, so he ran away from home. The world can be a scary place for a little dragon who can't breathe fire. Crispin found a dark cave. I'll be a fireless dragon all by myself. I won't bother anyone and no one will bother me. 
An hour later, he had a visitor. I am Sir George, squeaked a thin, shiny knight. Ch -ch -ch Show yourself, dragon. Crispin shuffled out of the cave. The thin, shiny knight held up his thin, shiny sword. D -d -d Do your worst, dragon. Crispin opened his mouth, but fire did not come out. Soap bubbles came out. Don't you breathe fire, dragon? Crispin shook his head. I don't. I can't. Sir George moaned, but my father insists that I fight a fire-breathing dragon. It even says here in my book that your typical dragon breathes fire. I'm not your typical dragon, Crispin explained. Sir George sighed. I can't go home. Me neither, Crispin nodded. But then he had an idea. Maybe your book could tell us what to do. Of course, Sir George searched through the pages. It says it's probably just your diet. Sir George fed Crispin spicy curry, scorching chili and blistering salsa. Crispin opened his mouth, but fire did not come out. Red party streamers came out. At least they're the right color, Sir George said kindly. Sir George searched through the book again. Ha ha, it says it's probably your attitude. Sir George showed Crispin how to look mean and angry enough to breathe fire. Friends, can you show me your angry, mean face? Urgh. Oh, that's very good. Crispin opened his mouth, but fire did not come out. Soft, cuddly teddy bears came out. Hmm, said Sir George. We may have taken a step backward. It's no use, Crispin sighed. I'm just not your typical dragon. But Sir George was not ready to give up. Aha! The book says you're too stressed. Sir George made Crispin close his eyes. Can you close your eyes, friends? While he described a quiet, relaxing day at the ocean. Do you feel calm? Now imagine a hundred shiny knights attacking you. Crispin opened his mouth, but fire did not come out. Beach balls came out. Well, that's just plain weird. <sighs> Secretly, Sir George was glad that Crispin couldn't breathe fire. He liked the little dragon and didn't want to fight him. Crispin liked the shiny knight too, but he missed his parents. Sir George, it's getting dark. I want to go home. The shiny knight patted him on the back. Don't worry, little dragon, I will take you. Crispin's parents were relieved when he arrived home safely. Sir George was about to say goodbye when they heard a shout. There you are, boy! Why on earth are you playing with the fire-breathing dragon? He's my friend, father, whispered Sir George. And besides, he doesn't breathe fire. A dragon that doesn't breathe fire? <laughs> That's the silliest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> the shiny man laughed. Crispin's father stormed out of the house. My son is not silly. He may not breathe fire, but I certainly do. Crispin's father let out a powerful spray of flames. Do your worst, dragon, the shiny man declared. But then the flames scorched the lawn. That's enough, honey, said Crispin's mother. The flames singed the fence. You've made your point, dear. Now stop showing off, she scolded. Then the flames ignited the roof. Crispin's father panicked. I, I can't stop breathing fire. You'll burn our house down, cried his mother. You'll burn down the whole neighborhood. Dragons came running from all directions. They knew how to start fires, but no one knew how to stop them. Crispin suddenly felt a tingling in his tummy. He felt a bubbling in his belly. He opened his mouth, but fire did not come out. A gush of water shot out. Crispin aimed the water at his father's flames. He saved his house and he even saved the shiny man who wasn't looking so shiny anymore. Hooray for Crispin, everyone shouted. On Crispin's next birthday, there was a big party. Family and friends came from all over the land. Sir George and his family came too. Lots of dragons were dancing and Crispin stood with his mouth wide open. Fire did not come out. Music came out instead. Your son, said an old uncle to Crispin's father. He's not your typical dragon, is he? No, replied Crispin's father. My son is something special. And then he jumped up and danced to Crispin's music too. The end.
Very good job, friends. I hope that you liked that story. It's one of my favorite dragon stories. I always think it's wonderful when we read about being ourselves. Oh, friends, I hope that you liked my story about dragons. And now we're going to do a story about my favorite mythical creature. Can you guess what it might be? With a shiny gold horn? That's right, friends. It's a unicorn. This is called You Don't Want a Unicorn, with words by Amy Dykeman, illustrated by Liz Klimo. Are you ready, friends? <clears throat> Wait! You were going to wish for a unicorn, weren't you? Wishing for a unicorn is a big mistake. Just step away and, uh-oh, things are about to get ugly. Trust me. Sure, having a unicorn seems fun at first, all right, super fun, fine, it's awesome, okay? But it's not worth it. What you don't know is that unicorns shed and scratch, and no matter how hard you try, unicorns can't be house trained. You do not want that, trust me. And don't even get me started on the jumping and the chewing and the burping Hey, not bad. You probably could pull this off if it wasn't for the biggest top secret nobody knows about it problem with having a unicorn. Unicorns live in groups. And when a unicorn gets lonely, ding, 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 it calls a friend. No, right when you're thinking that this could be double fun, poof, there's another poof and another poof and another great you've unleashed the most destructive force in the universe a unicorn party i told you why didn't you trust me quick grab your piggy bank run you have to wish them away plip 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 poof 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 <sighs> yeah that one needs to go back too it's for the best trust me Poof. Oh, cheer up. You could get a goldfish or a nice rock or, uh-oh, stop! You don't want one of those either. Trust me. The end. Friends, do you think that maybe it might be too much trouble to have a unicorn? Having to clean up after it? I think it might be too but I'd still really love to have one. All right, friends. Earlier, I mentioned that there are mythical creatures that can be found all over the world. The next book that we're gonna read is about a mythical creature that can be found in Asia. It's a Yeti. This is The Thing About Yetis by Vin Vogel. Are you ready, friends? The thing about yetis is that yetis just love winter. They love waking up on snowy and quiet mornings and drinking hot chocolate with their favorite stuffed toy. Isn't that one of the most wonderful things about winter, friends? They love sliding down hills on their bottoms and building big snow castles and pretending they are Godzilla. They love ice skating Yeti style. Yetis make the best snowballs on the planet and the best snowmen too. But sometimes winter can be tough, even for a Yeti. After all, Yetis get cold too, really, really cold. And when their snowy fur finally dries, it gets a little bit poofy. On those days when Yetis just can't get warm and the box of hot chocolate is empty, Yetis get downright crabby. So here's a little secret for you. The thing about Yetis is that sometimes they miss summer. 
They miss playing outside for hours and hours on long sunny days. They miss looking for little creatures by the sea and having sea monster beauty contests. Yetis miss building big sand castles and pretending they are Godzilla. They miss zipping down splashy slides on their bellies. They miss wishing on a shooting star, the glowing light show of hundreds of fireflies, and the sound of crickets on warm summer nights. The thing about Yetis is that Yetis love winter because on the very coldest, wettest, windiest winter days, Yetis know just what to do. They make the warmest, coziest, calmest summer day right at home. The end. Isn't that a wonderful story? And winter just started, did you know that, friends? On December the 21st. So I thought that was kind of a fun story to share. It hasn't been too cold here yet, but it's probably going to get there. And then I bet we'll all be wishing for a warm summer day. All right, friends. So for our final story, we're going to read about a very special creature. One of the things that I've always loved about mythical creatures is the fact that sometimes it turns out that a mythical creature really exists. This is called, Is It a Mermaid? It's by Candy Gourlay with pictures by Francesca Chessa. Are you ready, friends? One morning, Benji and Belle spotted something on the beach. What is it? Belle wondered. It, the something replied. I am not an it, I'm a she. I know what you are, Benji said. You're a dugong. Of course not, you silly little boy in a vest, the dugong said. Can't you see? I am a beautiful mermaid. See this? This is a mermaid's tail. No, Benji said, that's a dugong's tail. The dugong looked hurt. Then she brightened up. Listen to this. Oh, stop, stop, Benji cried. What are you doing? Why, I'm singing, of course, the dugong said. Mermaids love to sing. Me too, Belle said. You can sing all you want, Benji said, but it's not going to change anything. You are a dugong but the dugong was not listening. She was bouncing down the beach and Belle was bouncing after her. Watch, the dugong cried. Splash, stop, Benji yelled, stop, stop, stop. I was just trying to show you how mermaids adore swimming gracefully in the sea, the dugong said. Belle ran into the water. I wish I was a mermaid too, she said. Benji ran in after her. She's not a mermaid. She's a dugong. Look at those flippers. Those are dugong flippers. Look at that snout. That's a dugong snout. Look at that body. That's a dugong body. And do you know what a dugong is? It's a sea cow. Oh no, Belle said. Oh, Benji. The dugong tried to hide her tears, but her flippers were too short. Benji felt terrible. I'm sorry, the dugong said, but we mermaids are a bit sensitive. Me too, Belle whispered. Benji hung his head. It's me who should be sorry, he said. I hurt your feelings. The dugong smiled. It's okay, she said. We mermaids are very forgiving. Do mermaids like to play, Benji asked. Mermaids love to play, the dugong said. For the rest of the day, Benji and Belle played with the dugong. They sang and swam, oh, and had a lovely time. At sunset, the dugong said goodbye. I have to go, she said. Mermaids never stay out after dark. Goodbye, called Benji and Belle. Will you come again? Of course I will, the dugong said. There she goes. Benji and Belle walked home as the sun sank into the far side of the world. I love mermaids, said Belle. Me too, said Benji. And then there's a little bit about dugongs, and I thought I'd read that to you, friends. It is said that during the 17th and 18th centuries, European sailors arriving on Southeast Asian shores mistook dugongs for mermaids. 
In fact, the dugong is a sea cow, but the word dugong is from the Malay word for mermaid, dugong. Although dugongs are called sea cows, they are more closely related to the elephant. They even have little tusks hidden in their mouth, and like elephants, they eat a lot. A dugong can eat up to 40 kilos of seagrass a day. That's a lot. Sadly, dugongs are under threat from sea vessels and the destruction of their seagrass habitat. They have been listed as vulnerable to extinction by the International Union for Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources. Today, seagrass meadows are under threat around the world. You can check out projectseagrass.org to find out how you can help save the dugong's disappearing habitat. And we'll make sure that we have that linked for you, friends. So one of the really wonderful things, and the reason I wanted to share this story, is because here in the United States, down in Florida, we have relatives of the dugong called manatees. They are also listed as a vulnerable population. And I just thought that was a wonderful story and a way to show how sometimes mythical creatures can actually exist. All right, friends, I hope that you had a wonderful time sharing mythical stories with me and having lots of mythical adventures. You can find more information about mythical creatures and all sorts of wonderful library events by visiting www.lf pl.org. I hope to see you there, friends. Have a wonderful day. Bye. <laughs>